Your time has come. Sleeping dragon, awake! Hello everyone, and welcome. My name is John Turner, and I'm so pleased you've decided to join me. In the past, several of my panels have been anniversary celebrations for Japanese animated features or series. Tonight's panel is another such occasion, this time for a 26-episode series, which is a little bit of everything. The show in question is considered a classic for many, many anime fans, myself included. It's known as The Vision of Escaflone, which first premiered in Japan 25 years ago. So naturally, tonight's panel is called the 25th anniversary of Escaflone. And now we invite you to join us as we learn about this much-loved show. It was April 2nd, 1996, when Escaflone's first episode was broadcast on Japanese television. Today, it is still highly regarded, and for good reason. Like most popular favorites, this series is rich with interesting behind-the-scenes stories, and what better way to learn about them than here? The show features a host of interesting characters, fascinating worlds, action-packed sequences, and a long, complex storyline which keeps viewers hooked from start to finish. The protagonist of Escaflone is one Hitomi Kanzaki, a high school teenager who, like most kids her age, likes to spend time with her best friend, Yukari. She also has eyes for Amino, who happens to be captain of the boys' track team. Most importantly, Hitomi has a special talent for fortune-telling via tarot cards. In fact, she can make predictions about events that might come to pass. And more often than not, they turn out to be accurate. One evening, Hitomi learns that Amino will be leaving Japan. She meets up with him at school and attempts to impress this Prince Charming of a boy. But just at that moment, a pillar of light materializes out of nowhere, and a newcomer appears with it. I'm Vana Finalio. Where am I? Seconds later, a ferocious dragon looms out of a portal and attacks Hitomi, Amino, and Yukari. Vaughn confronts and defeats the vicious monster. No sooner does he do so than both Hitomi and Vaughn find themselves transported to his home planet, Gaia where the Earth and the Moon both hang in the sky. All this in just the first episode! From here, the story becomes more and more complicated as we follow Hitomi on her peculiar and often frightening journey across this mysterious place. It soon becomes clear that Gaia is a world in turmoil, and its only hope is Escaflone a mechanical giant which can only be operated by Vaughn. If you think all this sounds complicated, it is. But we're only scratching the surface. There are still a lot more pieces in the puzzle of Escaflone that we have yet to discover. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We've got quite a lot of ground to cover, so now it's time to set off on our journey. The Great Levestone-powered airship, Crusade, and its captain, Gaddis, Oh, wait. Let's weigh anchor, men. Aye, aye, weighing anchor. Set sail. Okay, unfurl the sail. Unfurling sail. As much as we wish any animated production to simply appear in a pillar of light transported from nowhere, nothing could be further from the truth. It takes a lot of talent, effort, and ambition to realize a series like Escaflone. 
For one thing, you need an animation studio to produce such a project. In this instance, Sunrise. Sunrise was founded in September of 1972 and is renowned for producing works of outstanding quality. A majority of these productions have enjoyed both critical and popular success, including Cowboy Bebop, Inuyasha, Outlaw Star, Crest of the Stars, and arguably their most renowned series, Mobile Suit Gundam. The Vision of Escaflone is among their most beloved productions, although it took quite a long time to complete. Six years, to be exact. Why such a long time? The answer is quite a fascinating story. It was in the early 1990s when Escaflone was first proposed to be a television series, and the person who fashioned this project was Mr. Shoji Kawamori. Born on February 20th, 1916, he is renowned for creating series which have resonated strongly with animation and science fiction fans alike. One of his most popular creations is Macross, which, like Escaflone, involves battles with shape-shifting robots. Mr. Kawamori first came up with the idea for Escaflone on account of a trip he made to Nepal. While exploring its fog-enshrouded mountains, he envisioned, according to On America writer Egan Liu, a land surrounded by mist and invisible to outsiders, a land where a great epic about fate and divination could take shape. Shortly after this trip, Kawamori would propose his concept to Japanese animation distributor Bandai Visual, as well as Sunrise Studios. His pitch, if Macross was robotic mecha and love songs, why not a story about robotic mecha and divining powers? To further visualize the world of Escaflone, Kawamori and Bandai visual producer Minoru Takanashi turned to all sorts of books involving mysteries for inspiration, namely Atlantis and the Bermuda Triangle. Incidentally, Atlantis itself is worked into the story. Lots of times when a project is in development, be it live action or animation, there are bound to be differences between the planning stages and the finished product, and Escaflone was no exception. Originally, Yasuhiro Imagawa, director of series such as Giant Robo and Mobile Fighter G Gundam, was brought on board to helm the series. It was he who fashioned the title for the show, after a Latin-based takeoff of the word Escalation. Interestingly, the show was previously known under a different name, Air Cavalry Chronicles. The reason? It was initially planned to be set during World War I with transforming airplane fighters. But such a vision would never come to pass, for better or worse. During this early stage, Imagawa conceived Escaflone as an action series targeted for males. There would be thrilling battle scenes involving giant robots, and Hitomi was imagined as a cute, curvaceous character, and not intended to be the main protagonist. Such elements were staples of graphic novels aimed at boys in Japan. Graphic novels are known as manga in Japanese, and there are two types of it. Shonen, which means boys' comics, and shoujo, which is girls' comics. Had Escaflone been produced as Mr. Imagawa had intended, it would have no doubt been aimed at the shonen audience. So why didn't it happen? Well, as fate would have it, Mr. Imagawa dropped out of the project and went on to direct a spin-off of Sunrise's popular Gundam series. As such, Escaflone was put on hold for nearly two years. Fortunately, the project would be revived when a new director took the reins, Mr. Kazuki Akane. Born in Osaka, Japan on March 24, 1962, Mr. Akane had previously worked on other projects such as Mobile Suit Gundam 0083 Stardust Memory and Future GPX Cyber Formula. Under his leadership, Escaflone would evolve from an edgy, suggestive show targeted toward males to one aimed at broader audiences. This was done by incorporating elements inspired by shoujo manga. It was his idea to include tarot cards as well as handsome knights into Escaflone's labyrinthine story. 
Unsurprisingly, under Mr. Akane's direction, the show's cast of characters, particularly Hitomi, received a significant overhaul. It was his decision to not only make Hitomi the protagonist, but to reimagine her as a deeply confused but sympathetic heroine, one that audiences could relate to. Further contributing to the appeal of its characters were the contributions of illustrator Nobuchero Yuki, who was brought in to provide the designs for Escaflone's eclectic cast. Mr. Yuki, born on December 24, 1962, is no stranger to fantasy. He worked on a similarly famous production, Record of Lotus War OVA. In that show, Mr. Yuki was tasked with adapting Yutaka Izubuchi's character illustrations into their animated counterparts for the 13-episode video series. With Escaflone, Mr. Yuki would have the opportunity to create the characters from scratch. In fact, he considers Hitomi one of his favorite designs. Mr. Yuki continues to collaborate on other projects with Escaflone's director, Kazuki Akani, to this day. Speaking of which, it's time we take a look at several members of the cast of Escaflone. The stage is set. The cast assembled. As mentioned earlier, Gaia is home to all sorts of hybrid animal beings. There were wolf people, a mole man, yes, mole man, gecko men, a rat man, leopard woman, a canine man, and even a dolphin man. Hello, miss, and a good day to you. <laughs> In addition, there are samurai, monks, princes, princesses, kings, dukes, merchants, cultists, soldiers, scientists, doppelgangers, and beings with angels' wings. Many kingdoms across Gaia also have their own cultures, designs, and styles as well, which makes it a world of fascination and exploration. In fact, Escaflone is as much a tour guide through this fantasy world as it is an epic. Through it all, the whole story is unsurprisingly told from Hitomi's point of view. Hitomi, incidentally, is not your typical protagonist for a show of this kind. For one thing, she's very athletic, as you see here. Perhaps most intriguingly, she has special powers that prove to be of valuable assistance to our heroes, notably from a pendant she wears around her neck. It's a good luck charm. Using this, Hitomi is able to locate enemies that otherwise cannot be seen, particularly dangerous ones about to make a move. They're straight ahead of us! But Hitomi is also a very sensitive character. In fact, she does not wish to use her powers as a tool for war. Since I came to Gaia, my readings are so accurate it's terrifying. And the things I see are awful. I hate having those visions. But perhaps Hitomi's biggest dilemma is a question she struggles to answer throughout the show. Just who exactly is she in love with? Is it her Prince Charming from Earth, Amino? The dashing, charismatic Alan Shazar? Or the brash, hot-headed Von Finel? Jeez, am I really that flaky about guys? At certain points, characters call Hitomi out on her indecisiveness. For instance, This is Merle, a cat girl who is fiercely devoted to Vaughn, and she wants everyone to know that, including Hitomi. Unsurprisingly, these two get off on the wrong foot. Or should I say the wrong paw? You get back down here, cat burglar! <laughs> Handbane's dress better than that. I'll pull your tail! <laughs> Yet when Hitomi gets into trouble, or nearly faces death, Merle does not hesitate to get help, much less show concern. And she actually comes to care for this girl, even though she likes to pretend otherwise. There are other love triangles in this story. The central one which drives the show is between Hitomi, Vaughn, and Alan, all of who are fully realized complex characters who are as likable as they are relatable. 
Vaughn is the more aggressive and troubled of the two men, and who can blame him? As a child, he lost both of his parents, and his older brother left mysteriously after failing to pass a ritual required for becoming king. Naturally, Vaughn assumes the position of heir, only to have his home kingdom, Finalia, razed to the ground. He vows to avenge his people, but it's a struggle that tears at his soul. As such, he is very impulsive and frustratingly stubborn, often making reckless judgments. Whatever you've done, you're gonna regret it! It's not terribly wise to threaten someone you know nothing about. He's also not particularly good at expressing himself, and at times he can come across as insensitive. I want you! I mean, I want... I want your power! <sighs> Despite his faults, however, Vaughn still has a soft side to him. He's loyal, brave, and always ready to save Hitomi. In fact, he'll do anything for her. I want to help you too. I'm gonna find a way to send you back home. I promise. He even expresses concern when he sees her looking downcast. More often than not, his recklessness gets him into trouble, and Hitomi or Alan rush to rescue him. Which brings us to Alan, a courageous and charming fellow with impeccable manners and a gentle nature. These qualities make him very attractive to the ladies. Perfect picture of a knight in shining armor, right? Well, if truth be told, Alan turns out to have issues of his own too. His mother died when he was young, and his little sister mysteriously vanished. We also learn that he holds a serious grudge against his father for choosing to leave his family to go off on expeditions instead of staying and caring for them. I loved your mother dearly. You liar! How can you say that to me? You're the one who left us! In many ways, Alan and Vaughn are very much alike, and perhaps because of this, both become invaluable allies over the course of Hitomi's adventure. But there is conflict brewing beneath the surface of their friendship. After all, both men are attracted to Hitomi. Because of these contrasting and compelling personalities, Hitomi, Vaughn, and Alan are all genuinely interesting protagonists, which is a great asset to this show's propulsive story. Even the villains are well-defined. For instance, there's Dylan Dow, a vain youth who is as cruel as he is sadistic. He commands an army of boys who he refers to as the Dragon Slayers, often abusing them. But his greatest pleasure is bloodshed. He gets especially deranged when he goes out on rampages. <laughs> burn! Burn! He comes across as a particularly dangerous and formidable foe to both Vaughn and Alan. I am going to crush you, Dylan Dow! <laughs> Go on and try, Alan! Please do! But even this monster has a vulnerable side to him, too. <laughs> Prepare to die! Then there is Falcon, a shadowy man who is Chief Stratagos of the Zybok Empire. Unlike Dylan Dow, he isn't so much evil as he is misguided. He believes he is fighting for a good cause. Of the villains, Falcon is the most complex and interesting. He is also eager to lure Vaughn over to his side. Vaughn, I want you to join us. Come with me now. Together we'll create a new world. Both Dylan Dow and Falcon answer to the only villain not having any redeeming qualities, Dornkirk, the Emperor of Zybok. Although he spends most of the time strapped in a strange machine looking into a telescope, Dornkirk still poses a very serious threat to the future of Gaia. Can Hitomi, Vaughn, and Alan stop this man before he realizes his twisted agenda? I invite you all to watch with me. Watch the new fate of mankind. <laughs> That's right! Show me what I wish to see most! I must see my dream, my ideals come to life! Well, if you want to find out what happens, you're going to have to watch Escaflone for yourself. 
As you can tell, the deeply rich characterizations are one of its biggest attractions. But there's more to Escaflone than even that. We certainly do get some odd visitors. <laughs> For fans of action and excitement, there are plenty of sequences involving narrow escapes, chases, and even battle scenes. Although some of these fights happen the traditional way via crossing blades, a good lion's share of the battles involve the giant robots operated by certain characters. Japanese animated shows involving such mechanical wonders are often called mecha. The word mecha is actually an abbreviation for mechanical in Japanese. It tends to refer to both scientific ideas and science fiction genres which center on giant robots or machines, nicknamed mechs, controlled by people. Typically, though, mechas tend to be depicted as humanoid robots. In Escaflone, these robots are known as gynorphs, and they not only come in all shapes, but different abilities as well. Naturally, the most important of these gymolifts is Escaflone itself. It can only be powered by a small diamond-like gem obtained from killing a dragon, which explains the dragon fight in Episode 1. This gem, known as a Drag Energist, provides Escaflone with all sorts of abilities. For one thing, it wields a massive sword which can sever anything in just one slash. It can even transform, yes, transform, into a magnificent dragon who can fly extremely fast if need be. But Escaflone also possesses some dark secrets of its own, one of which puts Vaughn's life in danger. Alan too operates a Gaimalif of his own, dubbed Sherazad, and fittingly for his character, it is shaped like a massive knight. It doesn't possess the ability to transform like Escaflone, but it's every bit as powerful in combat, matched only by Vaughn's. Other Gaimalifs, such as the ones operated by the Zybok Empire, are much more dangerous. These giants use retractable and malleable crema claws which can impale anything. They also use flamethrowers, especially Dylan Dows. Not only that, but these Gaimalifs can make themselves invisible via stealth cloaks, which provides opportunities for surprise attacks. Still other Gaimalifs have their own choices of weapons. Lances, bows and arrows, and even a hook and chain. These mechanical wonders are designed by Kimitoshi Yamane. Born on January 30th, 1966, his work can be seen in other animated productions, such as Bubblegum Crisis, Gotcha Man, and Cowboy Bebop. In addition, the artist has also authored a book which features his detailed designs. Unfortunately, this can only be found in Japan. The world of Escaflone also provides a wide variety of vessels as well. There are airships, boats, convoys, and flying fortresses. Yes, really! All of this would give you the impression that a lot of serious thought was put into crafting the world, characters, and cultures of Escaflone, and you'd be absolutely right. It's a sort of Alice in Wonderland, plus shades of the never-ending story, The Wizard of Oz, and even The Chronicles of Narnia, all in one. A most impressive mixture indeed. Then, of course, there's the music. Oh my gosh, that music! In many ways, it's the real star of Escaflone, and the person responsible for this magnificent score is one of Japan's most talented musicians, Yoko Kano. Born on March 18, 1963, Kano has provided music for numerous anime series and movies, as well as live-action cinema, video games, and advertisements. Millions of fans adore her work, and for good reason. She is widely recognized for her versatility and gift of providing melodies which are as haunting as they are rousing. With a little bit of help from her former husband, Hajime Mizuguchi, she crafted a soundtrack which today is hailed as one of her greatest achievements. 
That's not to say that Kano and Mizuguchi had an easy time writing their score. In fact, when they were commissioned, Kano was initially told that she would be working on a show with a high school girl who tells fortunes while riding a giant robot. As the script evolved, however, it caused confusion for both musicians, but not for long. Eventually, the fabric of the story settled into a satisfactory flow, inspiring Kano and Mizuguchi to fashion a musical palette of choral chants. Orchestral flourishes, vocalists, and emotional range. The end result provided the show with just the sort of epic tone the creators were looking for. Whether providing melodies for emotionally charged sequences or furious, action packed spectacles, the musical score of Escaflone never misses a beat. That has quite a pleasant ring to it. Even with all these ingredients, no movie or series would be satisfactory without a strong story. Fortunately, Escaflone packs a lot of world building, character development, and plot twists into its story. Watching each episode is the equivalent of reading a great fantasy book, the kind that you just can't put down once you get started. All of this is the work of talented writers, tasked with the challenge of crafting something that can hold audiences' attention. Amusingly, one of the writers of Escaflone's script, Hajime Yatate, isn't actually a person at all. It's only a pseudonym for the collective contributions of Sunrise's animation staff. It is believed that the name originates from a quote of a poem penned by Matsuo Basho, The Narrow Road to the Deep North. That's pretty hard to understand if you don't speak Japanese. The translation is, This is the first time I used my travel writing implements, and I was still reluctant to venture farther. The words Hajime and Yatate are taken from this quote. The same name has also appeared in numerous other projects the company has produced, like Ronin Warriors, Cowboy Bebop, and the Gundam series. The primary reason for Escaflone's engaging plot has to do with unexpected alterations in concept. You see, the show was originally slated to have 39 episodes, but before a single page of Escaflone's script could be written, the project found itself faced with budget limitations. As a result, Escaflone's episode count was shortened to only 26 episodes. This proved to be a bit of a problem for the writers, for they had already conceived a story just long enough to fit the show's initial length. So what do you do when you're faced with a crunch like this? Fortunately, Sunrise found the answer. Rather than cutting any plot points, it was decided to compress the story to fit all 26 half hours. As a result, Escafloni moves at a brisk pace with nary a wasted scene which is something that doesn't always happen with animated television series in Japan. That's super exciting! Escafloni's run on Japanese television lasted from April to September in 1996. But despite receiving favorable acclaim from critics and viewers, the show did not perform as well as expected in its native country. Instead, Escaflone would find its real audience worldwide. In South Korea especially, the show would earn even higher ratings on television than it ever did in Japan. Yet it was in America where Escaflone would make its biggest impact. Having said that, Escaflone's success in America didn't happen overnight. It took time, as well as a false start, to achieve that status. The first American release of Escaflone was in the late 1990s on video, distributed by Anime Village, a subsidiary of Bandai Entertainment. Bandai Entertainment was the American office of Bandai Visual, and one of the premier distributors of Japanese animation in the 90s. 
Around this time, anime was usually issued on video cassette in two formats, either dubbed into English or in Japanese with subtitles, which is what this edition of Escaflone was. Typically, anime dubbed in English outsold subtitled releases in the market, but Escaflone got lucky. Eager fans purchased the video cassettes in huge numbers. In fact, it outsold Bandai's most popular release, Gundam, for a short period. As a result of this success, Bandai realized that Escaflone had the potential to reach an even wider audience in America. Back then, one of the best ways of doing so was on television. And so, a deal was struck with Fox Kids Network. But when Escaflone premiered on American television, it was nothing at all like the show Japanese audiences had viewed. For the sake of appealing to American viewers, there were episodes which were trimmed, merged, or even worse, cut altogether. To add insult to injury, the opening and ending theme songs for Escaflone were replaced with this. Yoko Kano's score, too, was heavily compromised, most of it replaced by music from some of Fox's own in-house musicians. What are you doing? Hold on tight, Fong. No, wait! Ah! What are you doing? Hold on tight, Fawn. No, wait! Ah! Aft mooring anchors! Fire! Okay, let's board them! Okay, let's board them! Other cues from Kano's music were either shuffled around, or worse, dialed out altogether. Uh, I should have killed you when I had the chance! You're gonna die! Uh, uh, I hate you! Uh, I should have crushed you when I had the chance! Taste my steel! You're a weak coward! Practices like this were common around the 1980s and late 1990s whenever anime was localized for American television. Now, there have been cases where some series, like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh!, have been able to get away with such alterations and become success stories, whether purists approved of them or not. But with Escaflone, Fox's alterations proved to have just the opposite effect. As much as critics and hardcore fans were horrified by what Fox had done to the show, public reception proved to be even worse. The show failed miserably on Fox Network, earning poor ratings after a few episodes were aired, and unsurprisingly, it soon disappeared. As dismal as Escaflone showing on Fox Kids was, it only proved to be a minor stumbling block on its road to mainstream acceptance. Shortly after, the show was issued on DVD, 
uncut and unaltered. Unlike the disastrous Fox broadcast, the DVD set was a huge success. In fact, the first volume was the fourth best-selling anime DVD for the month of September 2000. The English-language version of Escaflone was recorded by Ocean Studios in Canada. Of its cast, one of them is sadly not with us anymore. Canadian actor, comedian, and writer Kirby Morrow was the voice of Von Fennell in this dub. He has voiced numerous other characters for animation, but Vaughn was one of his favorite roles. Sadly, the actor struggled with substance abuse and depression in his life. He passed away last year at the age of 47. Today, there are fans who still admire his work as Vaughn, as it is one of the strongest assets of the Ocean dub. I, Vaughn Fennell, new king of Fennelia, bind myself by blood pact to thee, Escaflona. Thou sleeping dragon, awake! What did you do to that girl? I'm gonna kill you! Making rash threats is never a good idea. I want you. I want... I want your power! Prepare to die! There's one thing I know for sure. I'm going to help you find your way back there, no matter what. This version was used for the Fox Kids broadcast and the Bondi DVD release but not to unanimous praise. As mentioned, fans of the Japanese version blasted the Fox dub for its alterations. Fortunately, none of these changes were replicated for the Bondi release, but that didn't mean the dub itself received a more favorable response from fans. Some still found fault with it. In part, these criticisms were understandable. You see, when Escaflone's dub was made, Ocean Studios was using a digital system called WordFit, which artificially matches English words to mouth flaps. Unfortunately, this process would sometimes result with awkward-sounding dialogue. Escaflone's dub sadly suffered from several bizarre moments partially on account of WordFit, such as these. So give me back my Escaflone, and give me back my Guy Mellif. Why must it sting so much? Cheek, 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 cheek. Now alter the fate. In addition, Ocean Stub contains cases of certain characters played by different voice actors for select episodes, as this chart here demonstrates. Furthermore, there were also pronunciation distinctions, as well as casting choices, that some fans found odd. Please, miss, excuse me. My name is Hitomi Kanzaki. You're pretty good, Delandau. <sighs> You're a strong one, Alan. Lovely! Come down here, you cat burglar! Those are two very strange girls. And what's the matter, Yukari? I am a knight of Astoria, Alan Shazar. Amano, the banquet's starting! All this said, the Ocean Dub has numerous performances that are still worthwhile. It's my good luck charm! Vaughn, straight ahead! <sighs> my readings were just a little more accurate than other people's. But since I came to Gaia, they're so accurate, it's scary. Am I really that fickle? Try sorting out your own feelings first. That's an insult to handmaidens. Bad kitty. <laughs> Anyone who has lost a loved one will always shed a tear. Liar! You never loved my mother! You broke her heart! Vaughn, come with me now. Come with me so that we can create a new world. Now sit back and watch with me. Watch the new fate of man. <laughs> Come on, show it to me. Show me my dream. Show me my ideal. Now here's where matters get even more complicated. Ocean's Dub of Escaflone is based on the version that was broadcast on Japanese television. As mentioned earlier, the show was cut down from its intended episode count, hence the lengthy amount of plot points in each half hour. 
but six of Escaflone's earliest episodes had some sequences which were already animated, only to be excluded on account of time constraints. When Escaflone was released on video in Japan, several of these deleted scenes were restored, extending episodes 1 through 4, 6, and 7 by several minutes. For a long time, these additional sequences were exclusive to Japan. That is, until 16 years later. At this point, Bondi Entertainment had gone bankrupt in America, and Escaflone was thankfully plucked from oblivion by Funimation. This license rescue also led to the creation of an all-new dub for the series, including the missing scenes. The project was announced on Kickstarter, and fans eagerly responded. After smashing its goal of $150,000, Funimation would reissue the series on DVD and Blu-ray. Unsurprisingly, the cast of this all-new Director's Cut consists of regulars you might recognize if you have watched Funimation dubs. Thankfully, too, the awkward moments from Ocean's Dub were fixed. But I want my guy my left back. Return Escaflone to me now! My cheek won't stop throbbing. It stings. 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 Beginning. Fate alteration. Funimation's dub also makes different casting choices for certain roles. In both the Japanese version and the Ocean dub, for instance, Amino and Alan are voiced by the same actor. This is meant to explain Hitomi's fascination with Alan. He reminds her of Amino. You've got to focus and give it everything you've got. Everything I've got? Mm-hmm. You'll do it. I'll never let you have Hitomi, even if it costs me my life. Funimation, on the other hand, casts two different voices for these characters, Austin Tyndall and Sonny Strait, respectively, who also directed the dub. You have to focus everything you've got and then launch yourself forward. Really? Is that what you do? <laughs> That's about it. If you need to talk, I'd be more than happy to lend an ear. It's the least I can do as a Knight of Asturia. I'm Alan Shazar. I'll never let you have Hitomi! even if it costs me my life. Perhaps the most significant difference in terms of casting is that of Prince Sheen, a character who appears for four episodes. This role is portrayed by a boy in the ocean dub, Alex Dodik, which is arguably another major asset to that version. You must be tired from your long journey. I most heartily welcome you to Freyd. Please feel free to think of my country as your own. I can't believe that you're a traitor. Why? Tell me, have you ever believed in someone with your whole heart? Huh? Sometimes it takes more courage to believe in someone than to fight and dismiss them so easily. In Funimation's dub, however, the character is portrayed by voice actress Bryn April. You must be tired from your long journey. I want you to think of my country as your own. It's important that you feel at home here, so please enjoy. How could you? I thought you were a true knight, but you betrayed us! Can you tell me something? Have you ever believed in someone with your whole heart? <sighs> Just doing that is a kind of bravery, you know? Sometimes it can take even more courage to believe in someone than to fight them. In the end, both the Ocean Dub and the Funimation Dub have their charms. And thankfully, Funimation has decided to include both versions as well as the original Japanese language track, on their Blu-ray release, providing viewers with the option to choose. As is always the case, which version sounds best is ultimately up to the individual. No matter which version, however, Escaflone is nothing short of a fantastic experience either way. Thank goodness! We've already learned quite a lot about Escaflone, but our journey isn't over just yet. There are still some more stories to tell. For instance, did you know that Escaflone has two different manga? Well, believe it or not, it does, and each are targeted at different readers. One of them was brought over to America by former publisher Tokyopop. This version, penned by Katsuaki, is meant to be targeted for males, or shonen in this case. 
Incidentally, this was actually the first time that the Japanese public would be introduced to anything resembling Escaflone. During the show's lengthy production period, Japanese publisher Kadokawa was looking for material to launch its all-new magazine, Shonen Ace, in 1994. Even though Escaflone had not yet been produced, Sunrise nonetheless provided both production drafts and notes to Katsuaki, whose interpretation adheres closer to how the show was initially conceived. This edition does not involve any tarot cards, and is actually a grittier, action-packed tale filled with violence. The characters are also conceived somewhat differently from the show, too. Hitomi, for instance, is portrayed as a long-haired girl in glasses, just as the previous director, Mr. Imagawa, had initially conceived her. As a matter of fact, it is she, not the drag energist, that empowers Escaflone which turns her into a curvaceous nymph. Naturally, such stuff, in addition to tense, violent battles, were typical staples of series targeted toward males, and Katsuaki's interpretation of Escaflone was no exception. The second manga series of Escaflone, on the other hand, is the reverse. Targeted more toward girls, shoujo, this edition, as crafted by Yuzuru Yashiro, premiered around the same time Escaflone's first episode was broadcast in Japan. This version is far less violent and concentrates more on character development. In fact, there are no robots involved in this tale, and Escaflone doesn't appear until the final chapters. Hitomi is noticeably less suggestive in appearance, and both Alan and Falcon look strikingly different from their counterparts in the show. There is also a brief moment where Vaughn wears blue jeans. Sadly, Yuzuru's version came to an unexpected stop after only ten chapters, the same time as Kaflone completed its broadcast. The reason? Because the show, as mentioned, was not a huge success in Japan. If you're confused by all this, I don't blame you. But things are about to get just a tad more complicated, as there is still one more interpretation of Escaflone. On June 24, 2000, a 95-minute movie, Escaflone, A Girl in Gaia, premiered in Japanese theaters. This feature was made possible by the international success the show received. It is yet another retelling of the show, and a dark, gritty one at that. This version also reinterprets the characters differently than their television counterparts. Hitomi is portrayed as a depressed and gloomy teenager, stripped of her talent for fortune-telling. She considers suicide, but soon finds herself transported to Gaia. It turns out that she is a reincarnation of the legendary winged goddess who has the power to bring the dragon armor, Escaflone, to life. Together with a rougher and initially more aggressive Vaughn, she joins forces with him to save Gaia from the evil Black Dragon Clan, led by Falcon. Falcon, incidentally, is no longer the ambiguous noble figure we know from the show, but a cold-blooded, ruthless villain with zero redeeming qualities. Other characters from the show, like Alan, Merle, and Dylan Dow, are underdeveloped in this feature, while others are either reduced to non-speaking cameos or removed altogether. For instance, there is no Emperor Dornkirk in this movie. The film does, however, introduce a new character, a mystic elf woman called Sora. It is she, not Hitomi, who possesses the power to predict the future. She is also attracted to Falcon. Like its television counterpart, Escaflone, a girl in Gaia, moves at a relatively rapid pace. But while some plot elements from the show still survive in some form in this retelling, the movie's overall story is considerably streamlined. As a result, many of the complex subplots which make the show's story so compelling are dialed out of this film. For example, there is no love triangle between Hitomi, Alan, or Vaughn in this version, nor any details of Alan having problems with his father. More distinctively, this movie portrays Gaia with a noticeably different style than that of the show. 
The kingdoms and some clans, for instance, do not share the same names as their television counterparts. And for the most part, lots of action sequences are portrayed as sword fights between samurai. Only toward the end of the picture is there a thrilling fight involving gymolifs, and even then, it's much more graphic than anything in the show. Despite being sold as a love letter to fans of the show, Escaflone, A Girl in Gaia, has received mixed reviews from both critics and audiences. Both sides unanimously agreed, however, that the animation is spectacular. And of course, Yoko Kano's music is still enchanting. Still another version of Escaflone is this PlayStation video game, released in 1997 by Bandai. Although faithful to the show's story for the most part, the game occasionally takes bizarre detours. For instance, there is one scene where Vaughn, Hitomi, and Dylan Dow are all transported to Tokyo. This situation is exclusive to this game. New characters are also introduced, such as Hitomi's classmate, Mizuru, who also operates a Gaimalif, as well as a female Zybok commander, Rafina. This game, which also features all new cutscenes animated by Sunrise, has never been issued outside of Japan, but is a source of fascination nonetheless. Why do so many versions of Escaflone exist? Perhaps the answer can be attributed to its convoluted production period or its eventual acceptance around the world, as on America writer Egan Liu suggests. Whatever the case, though, most viewers agree that Escaflone plays best in its 26-episode form, although its various other incarnations do have some merit. I wonder if it's by design or if it's by destiny. It is very rare to find an animated series which effortlessly manages to meld elements from various genres and craft a tapestry which today remains as fresh and inspiring as ever. Escaflone is one such show. Indeed, it is hard to believe that it was 25 years ago since the first episode premiered on Japanese television. And what better time to celebrate such an occasion than holding this panel? Even now, Escaflone is still highly regarded by anime fans, and there are many reasons why. Its mixture of imaginative worlds, epic scope, fascinating characters, and grand music compels viewers to keep coming back for more. And if you manage to come across this gem, either on DVD or Blu-ray, or even Funimation's channel for those of you who like streaming, chances are you too will fall under its spell. On that note, we've come to the end of both our journey and showcase of this much-loved series. I hope you found it enjoyable and interesting, and more importantly, that I've encouraged you to seek it out if you haven't already done so. I have more panels planned for this year, and they'll premiere right here on Virtual Panel Theatre. Keep your eye out for them! And I hope to present several of these panels in person in the event that cons start again. Until then, however, this is John Turner saying, Thanks for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye for now. Stay safe.